so excited for today's program. I have to tell our guest, uh, Jean Hanf Korlitz, and I were talking beforehand and we almost forgot to show up. We were enjoying it so much. Um, you may have heard of Jean Hanf Korlitz because of her book, You Should Have Known, which you might know as The Undoing, the Nicole Kidman hit series on HBO, which premiered in October, 2020. Or I hope, you have read her terrific new novel, The Plot, which became a literary phenomenon this summer. It was on the New York Times bestseller list, fabulous and well-deserved reviews, a blurb from Stephen King. She was even a guest on Jimmy Fallon after he picked The Plot as his summer read. But Jean has been an incredible writer for years, publishing smart literary novels. The Plot is her seventh book, I'm so honored and happy to have her at lunch today to talk about her work and her life. Thank you for joining us, Jean. You know, after that introduction, I actually wanted to leave the room instead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still- Don't you dare. <laughs> no, 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 I wouldn't do that to you, but really, I mean, I, I still hear that and I think, wow, who's that? You know, oh my <laughs> That is you. So, okay, to start. So what was more exciting, being on Jimmy Fallon, being on the New York Times bestseller list, or seeing Nicole Kidman play one of your characters? All three were unbelievably exciting, but in their own ways, complicated. You know, Nicole Kidman was not, not the person that I had in mind when I wrote the character who was Jewish in the book, Nicole Kidman, not Jewish. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, that was only one of many, many changes that were made. We were just <laughs> talking about this, making changes in books vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, the Bonfire of the Vanities. But, uh, you know, when you are the changee, it's challenging, but not insurmountable. And it is highly advisable for an author to get very zen on this issue if they choose to uh, offer their uh, their work for adaptation, if they choose to accept the filthy lucre from <laughs> the adapting. Um, and, and also, you know, there's, uh, there's an artistic principle here, which is that we are all adapters of previous work, whether we're aware of it or not, which is really what the plot is about. And if we don't want to participate in that, um, maybe pursue another line of work not a creative line. So, I mean, this is all very high-minded and stuff, but um, it, it is a complicated thing to see your work adapted. Um, very exciting, it's very fulfilling, but it's also can be quite irritating and distressing. <laughs> did, <laughs> did, you have, did you have any say whatsoever into any of it, or you just cashed the check and had to hold your Piece. Um, closer to the second. I mean, I, I uh, you know, David E. Kelly uh, did the adaptation. He, he uh, bought the rights. He did the adaptation himself. He produced it. Uh, he's not an unknown, you know, he's not a newbie. He's not a new kid on the block. I've been watching his work since I was a kid. And um, I was not going to call him up and give him my you know, my rookie suggestions about how he should do his job. Uh, it, it was very much a known entity that I was dealing with and, and one that I had a lot of confidence in. So, you know, he was very upfront with me. He said, uh, we're going in a different direction. We're basically gonna take these characters and, or a version of these characters and the situation they find themselves in and we're going to tell a different story. And that was okay. So, yeah. yeah. So that's one complication. What was the complication about being on the New York Times bestseller list? That can't be complicated. Oh, yeah, no, I am a very, I'm very much a head in the sand kind of writer. I, I don't look at the numbers. I don't want to know. If it's good, all I can think about is it's going to go down from there. So, <laughs> I mean, but, but, you know, it's like getting on the scale. That's another thing you just don't really want to do. So, um, uh, from the week that the novel was published, I, I really haven't looked. Um, and when they called me and they said, it's so exciting, you're number 13, woo, lucky number 13, it was great. 
But then the next week, there was no phone call, and there has not been a phone call since then. So it, it basically fell off the New York Times bestseller list uh, right away. And yet, I believe it is selling very, very steadily. And so maybe in the long run, I've actually done better than kind of boom, I'm on the bestseller list and then I fell off. I think I may be just flying right under the line. But everybody's yeah. happy. My publisher's happy. My my mom's happy. You know, <laughs> my husband's happy. Everyone's happy. I'm happy. But yeah, there there is anxiety in the numbers, and I tend to avoid it. That sounds very smart. And Jimmy Fallon, that must have been nerve wracking. <laughs> Lots of anxiety with that. So uh, you know, the, the, this was a. Um, it's not quite accurate to say that he chose it. It was a pure popularity contest. Um, what's really interesting about the Jimmy Fallon Summer Reads uh, competition is that it's not, uh, you're not vying for the good opinion of Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy Fallon says, okay, folks, I'm not a reader. I'm only going to read one book this summer. What should it be? And then he turns to his audience and they vote and they can vote as many times as they want. And um, you know, it's not a principal thing and people aren't saying I've read all six books and this is my favorite one. They're saying, hey, that sounds like a, a good title or that sounds cool. And he did make my book sound fabulous, but you know, I know some of these books, they're, they're great books. And um, I, I was absolutely thrilled that mine won. So the first thing you think is, oh my God, that's amazing. And then the second thing you think is, oh my God, no, I have to go on TV. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had about a, a month to prepare for that. And uh, it was quite nerve wracking. Writers, as you know, do not usually go on the Tonight Show. Maybe they did in the olden days when it was, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Carson and Gore Vidal would go on or, you know, uh, Norman Mailer or people like that. But in, 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 our, in the times in which we live, um, writers do not go on these TV shows. So it, 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 it was quite terrifying, but, but they're really great people there. And they took this nervous guest and they treated her exactly the right way. And he was terrifically nice. And um, it, it was a great experience. Okay, so I don't want to dwell on Jimmy Fallon, but I do have to ask you a really important question. Did you go shopping beforehand or did you wear something out of your closet? Because you look I great. Actually, I thank you. I actually, I think I posted a photo of my closet that had really hadn't even been opened in a, a year and a half. Like I have to go from, you know, basically leg the leggings and the jeans that I've worn for the last year and a half to dressing for the Tonight Show. And then I, I tried on a few outfits and I had a, a panel of friends that I sent pictures to. And there was a lot of agreement about what I wore. So I ended up wearing, um, it was a very, it was a mixture of high low. I believe it was an Oscar de la Renta skirt and a uh, shirt from J. Crew or The Gap or something like that. So it all worked out. I was comfortable and thank you for approving. <laughs> Oh, that's, it's so great. You kind of picked her outfit the way Jimmy Fallon picked the book, sort of through the <laughs> exactly. audience. I love that. Exactly so, right. um, so in prepping for this interview, I found this, I thought, very good article about you by The Guardian. And mm -hmm. I love the way you summarized your career before the plot. You said novels number one through six have been, this is great. This is great. This is great. Nobody is buying it. The end. <laughs> That's well, pretty that's, I have to say that's not really true because you did have a book admissions which was made into a movie which is a rare thing yes um, but, but it, it did not make more people buy the book ah okay fair <laughs> enough but what what do you think changed with the plot what do you think was the difference because I've loved all your books and I think um what was it do you think about this book and just for anybody who may not have read it and I, I've heard you briefly describe the story if you could just give the very short version of what the plot is about the plot of the plot and then and then and then what is it that do you think make made it connect so well with people uh well the the plot is a novel that is 
full of things that we don't want people who haven't read it to know. So it's, it's dicey to talk about it. Um, basically everything that has been approved for you to know is available on the book jacket. So I'm not going to cross that threshold, but uh, the plot is about a writer named Jake who is pretty uh, much on a downward tra trajectory. He's had a little kind of blip of success with his first literary novel. He barely choked out a second and now he's failing to write a third. He is not on anybody's mind in the world of that he wants to be a part of, which is the world of books and writers. And in order to support himself, he's now teaching in a pretty dire MFA program, a low residency MFA program in Northern Vermont. This is not the Iowa Writers Workshop. This is not the Columbia MFA program. This is sign up and write a check and you too can be a writer. And that's basically their come on to their um, future enrollees. So he's teaching this class and sort of trying to pretend that he, uh, you know, really believes in the ethos of this program, which is that anybody can achieve success as a writer, when in fact he does not believe that at all. Um, and into his class walks this just horrendous student who is arrogant and nasty and hostile and very dismissive of Jake's ability to teach him anything. And the reason for all of this, uh, you know, confidence is that he says he's writing a book that is guaranteed to be a massive success. And, you know, this is something that we hear authors say this. <laughs> I mean, authors, authors hear this from people. Um, and usually it turns out to be um, uh, somebody's narcissism or overconfidence or something. But in this case, when Jake hears what this plot is and he hears it in a private conference, um, not in front of other people, he is forced to agree that this book will in fact be hugely successful. So that's depressing, um, but it doesn't change his life. And a few years later, when he discovers that his student has died without having written his book, he wades into some morally murky waters and he decides to write his own novel with this plot. And, uh, and, and he does become very successful, uh, but he can't really enjoy it because he's too afraid that somebody will come out of the woodwork and accuse him of something. And that is sort of what happens. And that's it. I can't go any farther than that. A lot right. happens. <laughs> A lot happens and it's riveting. It is, I mean, I loved it because I will tell you so many times I read books that are on the bestseller list and they're not, I mean, they're not very good. And what was great about the plot is that it's both fun and entertaining. And, you know, you just keep turning the pages, but it's also so well written. And, mm -hmm. but it also, um, it also goes into something I think that you talked about in that same article that I think runs through the core of the book. So in that article, you described yourself, I love this, as a lifelong atheist, but deeply tortured by ethical guilt and moral compulsion. Wow. Um, I must I, 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 I'd like you to talk about that ethical guilt and moral compulsion and how it manifests itself in your work and your life. And we are at the American Jewish Historical Society. How much of that is related to being Jewish? Um, I'm going to go with 100%. <laughs> um, I, mean, I am a product of ethical culture schools uh, in New York City, um, but I was a perfect product of ethical culture schools because I, I am so uh, ensnared by guilt over many things, but I, am, I can't lie. I mean, look, I, we all lie. You know, oh, you look great. Oh, is that a neutral? You know, whatever. We all lie all the time. We lie to be polite. Um, but I, I, I'm a terrible liar. I, I torture myself. Uh, and therefore, for my entire life, I've been fascinated by people who lie and don't torture themselves. I mean, the, uh, the narcissist, the sociopath, the recent precedent, you know, I mean, it, it's just, to me, it's an endlessly fascinating display of 
a kind of humanity that is so foreign to me personally that I just keep opening the box and looking under the hood and trying to figure out how do you do that? How do you lie like that? And I'm, I'm never gonna stop doing that. And you know, my novels have been very, very different from one another, but when I look back at them, I see the connective tissue and that's it. The liars, the kind of, the alien creatures who walk among us, who have no problem uh, just lying to our faces, no problem at all. So yeah, that's, that's how you end up being a guilt-ridden atheist, I guess. Obsessive. And the Jewish part? You know, we, I, I stand at the end so far of a, one American story, which is like many of our stories in that my family came from an impoverished place uh, to an impoverished place, in our case, uh, Massachusetts, Haverhill, Massachusetts. There was a generation uh, in which somebody was a rag picker. Then there was a generation in which somebody had a store. Then there was a generation in which somebody went to medical school. And then I got to be a writer. You know, I, I am cognizant of that every day. Um, I, I feel such responsibility to the sacrifices, you know, even if my rag picker great great grandfather didn't say, gee, I'm doing this so that one day a descendant of mine can write a novel, I probably was not, you know, in his mind. But I I feel the privilege of it. And I may have shed the religious belief, but I have not shed the uh, feeling of uh, tribal pride and ethnic, you know, identity. So um, your dad's a doctor, your mm -hmm. mother a therapist, mm -hmm. a good combination for a writer. Uh, when, did, when did you decide to become a writer? Were you one of those kids when you were five years old, you were writing stories or diaries or what, when do you think it started? Well, two, two things. I mean, you may have been doing it and not have thought, oh, I want to be a writer. But at what point do you think that actually became something that you thought you'd like to dedicate your life to? And um, were there any people or books or something that actively influenced that thought process? Yeah, so funny you should ask that because just, just this morning I was interviewing uh, an applicant to Dartmouth. I do alumni interviewing. And I was interviewing this kid from a charter school in Harlem. And we were talking about that, that you know, this kid at 17 is not able to say, I'm gonna be X, I'm gonna do this. I mean, he's a, he's a normal kid, I'm sort of interested in this, interested in that. That's the norm. We were the freaks, you know, who knew at age five what we were supposed to be. Um, was it a great relief to know at age five or six or seven, which is the answer to your question, age five or six or seven, what I wanted to do when I grew up? Yeah, but I mean, if, if what you want to do is be a writer, you have other problems. Like, am I going to be able to be a writer? Am I going to be allowed to be a writer? Do I have the talent? Will I be successful? Do I have the work ethic? Will I have circumstances which will allow me to write novel after novel? I mean, there, there are plenty of dicey questions replacing the question of what, what do I want to be when I grow up? The answer to your question is very early. I was a voracious reader. It was the best thing anyone could do. I, I, I couldn't imagine anything better to do. I also probably didn't have the aptitude to do a lot of other things. I mean, I couldn't have been a doctor. I'm quite sure I never would have made it through organic chemistry. Never, never. I saw them fall around me freshman year in college. Smart, science-oriented kids just fell. And there's no way I could have gotten through something like that. Um, I was encouraged by a teacher. For me, that was huge. That was a huge uh, key to have my stories or poems praised at that particular moment. I think that was part of it. So really early and, um, oh, and books that I, um, you know, I was a really horsey girl. I, I did a lot of <laughs> writing. I went to summer camps, riding camps, and I read all the horse books. I read um, 
you know, Black Beauty, which is a beautiful novel, and uh, all of the Marguerite Henry books. And uh, so that, that's probably where the first, the first important books were. But I should also say that the single most important book I ever read as a kid was Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths. And um, I should also point out that it, I became an atheist at age eight because of Dallaire's Book of Greek Myths and uh, have never ever questioned that since. Interesting. And yet I did notice, I've been snooping around your background to do this interview that when you got married, you were married by a rabbi. I was surprised to see that, what, yeah. why? Guilt, guilt. <laughs> That's always Wait, a good answer. <laughs> I, you know, I, I cannot even believe I'm going to say his name because I'm so enraged at him. But I had read Alan Dershowitz's book about the vanishing American Jew at around the time that my husband and I got married. And I was fully aware that I was doing the bad, bad thing. Uh, my husband's last name is Muldoon. It is not a Jewish name. Um, and I suddenly felt like I, I think we should have a rabbi. And then of course we couldn't find a rabbi to marry me to somebody named Muldoon. Um, <laughs> we finally found somebody from what a friend of mine who also married a non-Jew calls the list of unscrupulous rabbis. <laughs> and he was great. And you know, we went for counseling and we promised things that we might not have fulfilled um, ultimately, but um, yeah, it was important to me and Paul was happy to do it. Oh, that's great. So I just got a comment in the chat from somebody who said that she teaches an adult class in contemporary Jewish fiction at the JCC here in Houston. And she said her fourth uh, author was Jean Hamp Corlitz. You just acquired 14 more readers. I feel like we're in a game show now. So Yay, thank, you. 14 more readers. So thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And also as we're talking, anybody who has a question you'd like to post, don't feel free to do that. And I'm glad you mentioned your husband because he is no slouch either in the literary oh, department. Gosh. Paul Muldoon, Pulitzer Prize winning poet who was the poetry editor of the New Yorker for a decade. I think and he has a new collection just now yeah, it came out I'm, I'm at his desk right now I should be able to reach for a copy but I I can't but yeah you may have heard of this little book called the lyrics that he just edited that came out That's, yeah that I can reach for him in a second yeah so um I'll wait till you come back to finish my question. <laughs> come back <laughs> okay good oh that's nice that he did with Another Paul named McCartney, also not Jewish. And <laughs> no, I years, think he is. No. Five years of interviews. And it is, I believe, number one in the New York Times bestseller list right now. It's a huge thing. And would, uh, it's, ama it's amazing. It's wow. 150 essays, uh, one per each uh, of Paul McCartney's songs. Wow, that is incredible. So that is a perfect lead in to my question, which is, that's a lot of brain power in your household. <laughs> lots, lots of in common, but also I would imagine, or maybe I'm just projecting a certain amount of anxiety to writers working at a pretty high level of production and success. How has it been? What's it been like to manage these two careers, especially when your kids were young. I mean, how did how, how do you do it? How did well, you do it? He, Paul's career was always, you know, in the forefront, not because he's a male chauvinist pig, but because, you know, he's, uh, you know, the term famous poet feels like an oxymoron, but in a few cases, it's, it's not. And, um, you know, it was almost a joke that Paul would go to some hole in the hedge and, Arkansas and there would be 500 people there I mean, and I would like fly across the country to give a reading for a new book in suburban Seattle and there would be me and the friend I was staying with and like maybe one other person so I mean uh, I was very much in the background uh, you know I, I, I'm not complaining I was able to stay home with my kids and uh, work around their schedules I've been incredibly fortunate he also has a full-time job teaching. So, you know, we had 
the kind of security that writers dream of. And um, the fact that it took seven novels to, to get to a place where this happened, um, it's, it's been great, actually. I mean, I, it wasn't great every step along the way. I'm as subject to envy and jealousy and you know, unkind thoughts toward my peers who have been more successful. I'm very human in that sense, but I will say that when it, when this happens after so long uh, to somebody, you know, who's been at it a really long time, you really appreciate it. Yeah, well, and that's a great lead and I'm getting some questions in the chat, which I will get to in a minute, but that leads me to something about Jean, which you're probably in the audience starting to get a sense of that, you know, a lot of writers don't celebrate one another's successes. There's a lot of schadenfreude in this business that's not very attractive. But Jean, I can speak from experience in addition to being a wonderful writer, is a truly good person. Mm -hmm. uh, and she is an enthusiastic cheerleader for her fellow writers. Mm -hmm. So I, I first met her years ago. You were, she, and I'd like you to talk about this. She had created this book group when they, when she and her family were living out in Princeton. And she had this incredible book group of people and she would invite authors to come and talk to them. And she invited me many years ago and I went and it was this, incredible experience to be in a room with readers and have this kind of a discussion that wasn't going to a bookstore and feeling that kind of it was very homey but also at a very high uh intellectual level and at some point a few years ago she turned that book group into a business called book the writer where you created these pop-up book groups that aren't these, so these aren't the usual book groups of friends who don't read the book and just eat dinner. These are- There's anything wrong with that. I mean, nothing wrong with it, but these are book groups who actually wanna meet the authors and read the books. And so they're pop-ups. And I wanted to know like, whatever made you think of this? Cause it's a huge production to put that on, to um, make all the arrangements and do it. And so what made you decide to do that originally? And, um, and then, and then how have you kept it going? I, I'd love to take credit for coming up with this idea, but in fact, my kids were in a very kind of crunchy granola school, a Quaker school. And when they had a fundraiser, you know, they, they were things like, I'll teach you how to make cupcakes. And, you know, I will take you for a walk in the woods and point out all the mushrooms. And, and the principal said to me, um, you know, all these writers, why don't you do something with the writers? And I thought, wow, that's a good idea. So I must give the credit to the principal of my children's former school, uh, Princeton Friends. And so we started this thing called um, the Meet the Author Book Club and participants made a donation to the school in order to be in the book club. And um, I, at back then I didn't pay the authors. I just said, I'll, 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 I'll pay for your train fare to Princeton and we'll sell 20 copies of your book. And for most of us, that's a big deal. I mean, to sell 20 copies is a very big deal. We are not all David Sedaris, you know, we are not all Jody Picou. It's, it's a big deal to sell 20 copies. And I think, I don't want to speak for you, but I, I believe that um, for most of us to be in a room with 20 really intelligent people who have gone out, bought your book, read your book, and thought about your book um, is a really nice experience. So I, I was often surprised by the caliber of people who would say yes to this invitation. I mean, Steve Martin came down to Princeton. It was, you know, we had a lot of a lot of local uh, authors like Chang Rayleigh and Joyce Carol Oates who were already there. It wasn't surprising that they said yes, but people came down on the train and just to sit in a room with 20 smart people who had bought their book. So when um, Paul and I moved back to New York 10 years ago, um, I decided to see if it could be a business. And um, we did a little tinkering with the model. And now basically we set up these, we call them pop-up book groups and anybody can, get a ticket and come. Uh, we were only in person before the pandemic. We were only online during the pandemic. And now we are 
attempting a kind of a hybrid. So the other night, for example, we were in a beautiful brownstone on the Upper West Side with Deborah Kopakin talking about her uh, memoir, Lady Parts. Um, we had 20 in the room, all vaccinated and masked, and then we had about 20 online. And everybody was able to ask questions and take part in the conversation. So that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody on this call who'd like to join us, either in person or online, all the events are on Eventbrite. Uh, and the website is bookthewriter.com, all one word. And you can sign up for the mailing list and then you'll hear about all of our events. But yeah, and I, will, and I will tell you as an author, they are really... It is exactly what you're saying. It's really a very wonderful experience. You feel like you're in sort of an old time salon in a wow, way because yeah. it is, it's a more intimate setting and it's really exciting. Before I go on to my questions, I have a question from somebody in the audience who asks, did you feel any qualms about revealing the plot in the book of that name since it would be hard to live up to its bidding as the best plot ever? <laughs> Though to judge from the reaction to the book, I guess you managed it. So were you really nervous about that? Yeah, sure, I was, I was. But uh, when I told my editor what this plot was and I told her as I was telling her the whole idea for the novel, she, her mouth fell open. So, and I mean, I, I am a, I am a voracious reader. I, I, I now use, um, I use Goodreads not to review people's books or talk to other readers. I just use it to keep track of what I've read because I read so much I often forget. And I can tell you that um, I have read something like 2,500 novels since I started keeping track. Um, that's not, that's a lot of novels, but that's not every novel. And, you know, I knew that this plot had not appeared in any of those 2,500 novels, but that doesn't mean somebody else didn't write it. But my editor has read every novel ever written. And when she, when she went, oh my God, like that, I felt comfortable that um, it may not be the greatest plot ever written, but it is certainly unusual. And, um, you know, some people figure it out before I want them to. Hats off to them, you know, you're very clever, congratulations. Um, but a lot of people don't. And uh, that has to be good enough because you're never gonna fool all the people all the time. Right, and I will say that even though the plot is the thing that pulls you through the story, it's not the thing that's the pleasure of the book, which is how it is in any great work. I mean, it's these characters and it's their neuroses and it's their lives and it's the way Jean constructs those parts of it. If it was only the plot, it wouldn't be that big a deal. What makes it a big a deal is the novel that's created around the plot. So I think, I, I think it's really important to say that. So yeah, it's a great plot, but without the rest, it wouldn't be that great. <laughs> so it's it's a it's a tautology, you know, and I think it's really important to say that because that's all credit to you. It's oh, credit you. to think of the plot, but then it's to put it in the middle of this great story and great characters. Well, I um, did try to get out of writing. I mean, that the chapters of this this character's novel appear in the novel, and uh, that was quite challenging. Not only because you know you you're tired when you finish a novel and the last thing you want to do is immediately write another novel to go in the novel but you also have to vary the narrative voice so it doesn't feel like I've written this novel so um that was that was difficult but also um you know I I really tried to get out of it I thought well I just won't write those chapters and then people will have to kind of imagine what it is without my explaining it um and I had listened to a podcast with Lily King in which she had defended her decision not to write the book within the book of her novel, Writers and Lovers, um, because as she said, no matter what I wrote, it wouldn't feel that it uh, could justify the, you know, the excitement over this protagonist's novel. And I thought, awesome, you know, <laughs> she's not writing hers, I don't have to write mine either. Um, and when I turned in the manuscript, it didn't have any of those book within the book chapters. And it was my editor who said, um, weren't you gonna write those uh, chapters of the book? And I said, yeah, but Lily King's not doing hers. So I don't have to do mine. And she said, no, you have to. 
<laughs> so I, I have to go back and basically do it. Um, you know, granted, I didn't have to write every page of a 300 page novel, but I had to write the highlights and I had to weave them into the narrative in the right places. And, you know, look, everything's challenging. This was challenging. Yeah. And that's a, a, I think for people who aren't writers who sometimes wonder what editors do, that's what they do. They make you go do that thing you don't want to do. That's so true. And I, I mean, the, the novel that I'd been writing before the plot that hadn't been working out too well, um, I, 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 I took this time away from it. I wrote the plot. And when I came back to it, I still didn't quite see uh, what had to be done. And it was my editor who told me exactly what I needed to do. And then I, you know, it was like emo head exploding emoji. It really was, she's a great, great editor. So. So um, that was a later question, but I'm gonna ask it now. That book actually has come, I mean, it was really interesting. That was a book that was put on hold to write the plot, right? Um, nope. But it's now coming out this spring, yeah, the late summer. So could you just can you tell us a little bit about it? What it's I can. Well, it's a it's a it's a much more Jewish book than the plot. That's for sure. Um, it's about a New York family called the Oppenheimers, and they happen to be descended from um, Joseph Oppenheimer, otherwise known as Jude Zeus, um, the subject of Goebbels uh, propaganda film, Jude Zeus. Um, it's, it's not a huge part of the latecomer, but it is a huge part of the psychology of at least the father of this family who's descended from this man. So it's a family, um, a wealthy family, um, in which they have triplets and much, many years later, um, they have another child from, uh, an unused embryo from the triplets. And the configuration, uh, this sort of late arrival, this late comer, um, is pretty much the final straw in an already very fractured family, um, which then just kind of uh, completely falls apart. But it's it, it's really about everybody in the family and their mishigas and their redemption, and um, it's it's not. I don't think you would call it a suspense novel, but it has a lot of twists and of its own. And uh, it took a while, it took a while to get right, but I really, really love this novel. Oh, wow, it sounds great. I, I can't wait to read it. Um, okay, I just got our five minute warning sign, but I have to ask you quickly, somebody wants a reminder of what was the title of the book you read when you were eight years old and decided to become an atheist or to be an atheist? It's Dallaire's book of Greek myths. I okay. still give it, I give it to like babies. I mean, I give it to the parents of the babies, always with a proviso. I mean, look, okay, this is not a guaranteed way to make your child an atheist, but you should know this happened to me. It is, it, first of all, it made an entire college course in Greek mythology completely redundant. I didn't learn a thing because I knew it all already. Um, it was the greatest foundation in, you know, Western civilization that anyone can ever have. It's so awesome. Um, uh, Madeline Miller, who we did a book the writer event with, has noted that the gods and humans and heroes of ancient Greek in this version are a little whiter than they need to be. Uh, and that is a valid comment. But uh, I'm not a professional classicist, so I don't have a lot of skin in that game. It, it really did, um, it was a, a profound experience because after hundreds of pages of these stories, these uh, gods and goddesses and humans, um, the gods are co-opted by the Romans. So they all get their names changed. And you know, that's, that's understandable, but then they die. <laughs> they die because the culture dies, the civilization dies. And I remember just thinking, oh, Oh, I get it. <laughs> we invented them. <laughs> they didn't invent us. And it just, you know, had exploding emoji again. So uh, yeah, that's, I, I remember where I was sitting when I was reading that. I remember exactly how it felt. And it was, you know, it was a life altering experience. Well, that's great. So this is the last question, sadly, because I'm really enjoying talking to you and hearing from you. 
Um, but I was reading that you were worrying about COVID very early in the game, because in addition to reading those thousands of novels, you read a lot about epidemiology. And um, I've been reading Gary Steingart's new book about a bunch of friends potting together in the countryside during the pandemic. And I was just wondering, do you think you'll be writing about the pandemic one way or the other and why or why not? I can promise you, I will never, ever, ever write about this. And I, you know, it's funny you mentioned the Gary Steingart book because I, I had been happily telling people I would also never read any of these novels. But now I've heard so many good things about this novel that I think I might already have to make an exception. I hated everything about this. I hated the fear, I hated the rage. Um, I still hate the idiocy that we're surrounded with, the unbelievable bad behavior that is going on even today. Um, and I, I, I do not wanna come back in my mind to any, anything about this. I was already a, terribly afraid of any apocalyptic scenario in literature, in movies. Um, so I can promise you this will never, I will never ever write about this. And I will probably never read about this except maybe Gary Steingart. Yeah, I would recommend the Gary Steingart because it's actually, it's, I was a little nervous about it, but it is quite, it's quite good. Cause again, it's the plot isn't the plot, you know, it's not, yeah. not quite, quite what you think. And, um, so I'm really appreciating that you came here today because you are, you have something else important you're doing this afternoon. Oh, I'm going down to Princeton where my son is a, an undergraduate back in college after leaving for a couple of years. Uh, he has a play that he directed and I'm gonna be a proud mom uh, at the final rehearsal. I can't go to any of the performances because I'm going to the Miami Book Fair tomorrow morning. Well, that is wonderful. I can't thank you enough. This has been so lovely, so wonderful to catch up with you and you. our large it, audience I, I and everybody. Thought, sorry. In case there's anybody on this call who does not know what an amazing writer you are, um, you know, The Net of Dreams is one of the best memoirs I've ever read. I can't believe your mom is on this call. I just, she's a hero and your late dad was a hero and I just, you know, I will never forget the family in that book. Oh my God. Well, thank Hi, you. Hi Julie's mom. You're awesome. <laughs> thank you, Jean. And anybody on the call who has not yet read the plot, I promise you, you'll have a wonderful time. Go buy it. Thanks. Try to buy it at an actual bookstore if you can, because we still want to have those things exist. Yeah. And, um, Thank you so much. Enjoy the play. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Julie, for your time. Jean, for your time. We were so honored to have you here today. Uh, and have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.